I like you, dude. I, I want you to keep doing what you're doing. I don't want you to stop doing what you're doing. Quite the opposite. Right. We are, uh... Yeah, fuck it, we're on. That's re... All right, yeah, I That's can on. Hear. That's recording. I can hear me. We're recording there. You, you, you want to um, sound that in front of you? Yeah, a little bit you closer. You know this. You know this I know shit, this, but usually is. hot mics, you know, I try to keep it back a little bit. Oh, you know, right, there we go. Oh, I'll, leave you, I'll leave it, I'll leave yeah, it to you. you know, I've been you. doing this a while. I know my voice projects. <laughs> my shit projects. <laughs> um, congratulations on surviving the Extinction Rebellion trip across town. Yeah, I was I was really surprised how uh, how scared the police were. It was really funny. Like, they were all hiding around a corner near the BBC. Like, literally hiding around the corner and all this stuff's happening around the corner. I was like, guys, come on. Why do you think that is? Well, because they don't want to get in trouble. Everybody's got a camera phone now. Exactly. So if someone says something like, F you, and then they film after that said, you know. Yeah, but you know we got to thank for that culture, didn't you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> America, mate. America, but you're well, all right, because you're Puerto Rican. No, no I'm, I'm also from New York. That's the island next to America, which is really important <laughs> to recognize. Have you been to New York? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and you've been to the rest of America? Yeah. It's completely no, no, different. No, no, I haven't. I've, oh. been, I've done New York. Yeah, well, if you go across the Hudson River, it's all bets are off. It's completely different. No one has a world view. Everybody's really concerned about nothing in particular, or about, you know, it's, it's really different. You mean if you go off Manhattan? Yeah. Well, Manhattan. out of New York City, really. Yeah. I went, out, people... I went out of there to go to a shopping center. Oh, really? Where? I mean, Paramus, uh, New Jersey. Yeah, I was married at the time. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> that happens, man. Yeah. Mate, funny enough, uh, just by coincidence, I met up with a guy earlier, um, literally just before this, and he's a, he's, a, he's a friend of a friend, so i got a mate who's just, in fact, the mate just had a mountaineering accident. He's oh, a shit. British Royal Marine. Oh, really? He was okay. a British Royal Marine, yeah. so obviously you a, you a US Marine, yeah. so he's a British Royal Marine. Um... And this lad was wanted to meet up with me and just and just chinwag. And he 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 was working. He was ex RAF, RAF regiment, which yeah. is I don't know if you know anything about that. Yeah, I do. I know okay, a friend cool. who's in that. Yeah. So uh, and he was working on the Mert teams in Afghan in oh oh nine no eleven twelve and then another company the other year. But the last job he was doing with the Mert teams, he was he was. Uh, Looking after the U.S. Marines. Oh yeah, um, we need looking after. Yeah, looking at, well, I say looking at. He wasn't yeah. looking at. He was patching patch you up, getting mm -hmm. you guys out. It's. Uh, I said, "Fucking hell, I'm off to do a podcast with the U.S. Marine now." Yeah. No way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. An old me. ass U.S. Marine, yeah. though. You know, <laughs> I mean, all you young cats, you saw a lot, man. When did you get in? When did you? I, I went in late '80s and got out. You know, mid '90s, you know, early '90s, really. Yeah, it, it was one of those things where nothing really, nothing really clicked as far as like you know. Uh, like a big campaign kind of thing or a deployment and stuff like that. There's always little things here and there. But like for the most part, I don't really talk about what I did in the Marines because when I do music and stuff and I'm on the radio and things, it seems to me, and you probably run across this when you talk to civilians, and I still think of myself as a non-civilian, right? But when you talk to civilians, it, it's, it's, it, it, they, once they get past the astonishment that you actually wasted time wearing a uniform and doing dumb shit that we did, right? They always kind of go, I just would, I don't understand it. So a lot of times I just don't talk about it. Because it seems, it, it, a lot of times, especially lately, a lot of times people, you know, they ask the question, have you killed anybody? Because oh, that's the thing everybody wants to know. And it seems kind of, that doesn't really define wearing a uniform for your country, does it? And it seems like it almost, it, it almost diminishes the whole, the whole vocation, you know what I'm saying? Where it's just about that. Because most people don't really understand it's about a lot of other stuff. That's interesting, yeah, it's interesting. So I, <clears throat> I agree, a, a million people listen now. Not a million, not that a million people listen, but I, I agree too. I know what you're saying. I can have, like, I can, I don't exactly like you. I don't like conversing with civvies, and it's mm. not because I don't like. I'm proud of what I did, much like you're probably proud of what you mm. did. But you, there's a there's a lack of understanding there. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. you can say, you know, well, oh, I was in yeah. Afghanistan, or I was, or is it, even just talking about training, mate. Mm -hmm. And they got a clue. They don't. Yeah. Like, they don't. Why, why would you do that? And, <laughs> yeah. Difficult to describe, right? And then you stick. I mean, for you, Hugh, you stick another U.S. Marine in front of you. All bets are off. You yeah. were talking till the flipping sun comes up. Oh yeah, is this crazy. A, you know, is is in understandings is it, it's a different. It's, mm -hmm. it's interesting, isn't it? It is interesting. But since well, I moved over here, though, what's interesting as well is that I, I talk to guys that are Royal Marines. I talk to a guy I have a friend who's in the RAF, RAF regiment, and it seems like we do have a lot in common, more so than I would with another countryman of mine who didn't serve in their in their military, which is really unique. I think it's like a brotherhood around the world of people who served on a certain side, like we say the Western forces and things like that. But, you know, for instance, if you were in a staging area in you know, northern Saudi Arabia in 1991, there was French Foreign Legion, there was USMC, there was Army Rangers, there was you guys. I mean, there was everything. And I remember one of the funny things about that was my love for Pernod, which is a, a French <laughs> shitty liquor. <laughs> and 
And it what is, is shit, yeah. What, what, yeah the, you let yourself down, you mate. Oh, man, but it's yeah. the only thing you could get, right? <laughs> and a lot of them French dudes loved Ritz crackers and, and uh, peanut butter. Because a lot of those French Foreign Legion dudes were not French. A lot of them were Americans. They were on some drug shit and ended up going to Marseille and just going in that door. So a lot of those dudes, oh, I'd do anything for some peanut butter. We were like, yo, you got some liquor? You know, that would work. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I used to drink that shit all the time. And my wife, she's like, yo, that stuff is terrible. I don't want to kiss you after drinking that. I go, why? Does it taste terrible? She goes, no, you act like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, flip my neck. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you then. I was going to ask you. i tell you one of the... When I, I've not had a chance to speak to uh, anyone who served the American forces mm -hmm. ever like mm -hmm. this, right? So I'm going yeah, yeah, to... Yeah. You're going to get battered now. With, right? with the best of my recollection, because it was 30 <laughs> years ago, man, all right? Let's make sure that way. Uh, yeah, look, yeah, this <laughs> podcast, right? That's what people do, right? <laughs> right, so and I'm not alone in thinking this. Mm -hmm. And I'm re really interested in your perspective as someone who served in the U.S. Marines and has now lived in the U.K. for yeah. how many years? About 10 years now, 11, going on 11. Okay, there we go, cool. So one of the, one of the biggest contrasts that I see in many... Uh, military in the UK and civvies see between the UK and the US is the perceived massive support of military veterans in the US mm -hmm. compared to the UK and the way it's yeah. demonstrated everything from when they're at ball games to mm -hmm. when you're um, you know, veterans days and, and mm -hmm. things like that what what's your opinion on that mm -hmm. is it oh is that an accurate view it, on it well I, I talked to a lot of guys that were in the services here in the UK, right? <clears throat> and it's like, oh, I wish people in the UK would be as understanding, as open-minded as a lot of the people in the United States are to to uh, supporting troops. Because you see that support the troops and those yellow ribbons and things. In my personal opinion, I think, uh, I think less than 0.5% of the population in America has ever served. And their families equal something like 3% of that. So you have 95% of the population in America who has no direct connection to anybody who's in the forces right now, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of in your face because the United States does do a lot of police action kind of stuff. And, you know, with Afghanistan and Iraq and all that kind of things, it was, it was really on people's minds. And you mean the foreign policy? You told yeah, the foreign right? policy yeah. That, 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 that led to a lot of people being deployed and things, right? So I think the interesting thing is to see that most people, and, and I don't want to say that it's patronizing, but in a lot of ways, people feel that it's the right thing to do to support the troops, which I, as a troop, you know, as a Marine, I think that's great. I think a lot of it's lip service, though. I think you get, just because it's a bigger country, the 330 million people, and I think in the history of the United States, there have been maybe 4 million Marines right, in the history of it since 1776. So I, I think being a Marine is a very small part of the United States Armed Forces, right? And I've always, when I was wearing the uniform, I'd always, people were always really nice, right? They were always really nice about it. Like, hey, you know, thanks for doing what you're doing. And I think that's kind of cool, but a lot of times, I don't mean to say I didn't do it for them, but I didn't do it for them. I did it for me, you know? And I think what I feel about what I did is a lot different from what other people feel when they see what I did. You know what I mean? Yeah, again, it's that perception thing. Yeah, right? it, is, it is perception. That's nine tenths of it a lot of times. I think what goes on in the UK, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably wrong in this. In my, in my opinion, I think a lot of people are confusing the people that carry out foreign policy with foreign policy. So when you have troops that go and do things, people say, well, you know, it's, you know, they shouldn't be doing stuff like that. So there's a negativity towards the actual armed services. When it should be the politicians that are sending these people there are the ones that should be getting the static, I think. And I think what we do is we try to lump things together because, you know, we're in a very ADD kind of society. If it doesn't fit in a nice, neat little box, we tend to kind of just glance over it. And you can't put, you know, foreign policy in the last 50 years of, you know, warring around the world into a neat little box so it does kind of overflow and that overflow is what you see when you see people kind of um, being really patronizing about things in america yeah yeah i think a lot <clears throat> yeah i think with uh uk wise with that confusing foreign policy with mm -hmm. the guy out there's a little bit of carryover maybe in in that uh negative perception of the armed mm -hmm. forces or mm -hmm. attitude towards it i think but i don't think it's i don't think it's that bad i think it's i think it's i think it's just more just a case of historically in country it's not been a case where soldiers have uh, 
should you say soldier, soldiers never ever meant of, of yeah. being cut about in uniform, mm-hmm. you know, all the time. Because, I mean, you think back to the sixties and seventies and eighties here mm-hmm. in the UK. Now you didn't go out in your uniform. Oh, yeah, yeah. You couldn't do it for mm-hmm. security reasons in the UK, in your own country, man. <laughs> in your own country, you yeah. couldn't do it, and that was that carried on right up until flipping it, the late noughties. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Late into my career, late noughties, even then, because it, the, the threats, the threat was still high of getting lynched, and it tra- and, it, and and it moved from being a Northern Ireland problem yeah. to that's still been a little bit, but then more as much been a, a problem around um, Islam extremism. Yeah. Well, you, I, yeah, they, so. I, I saw that thing that happened with those guys that got attacked outside their barracks and shit. That's fucking savage shit. I mean, the guy got his head cut off. It's fucking crazy. The guy got his head cut off. I, I mean, I remember, I remember just thinking to myself, what in the fuck kind of place is this where the people... Anyway, I get a little heated when it comes to that, right? And I know that we have a camera and we're recording this shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't want to say something I'll regret, but I don't think I will. I... I think a lot of times, and you know, this may this may be dating me, right? But I remember the generation before I went into the service was the Vietnam generation, right? And my father was a Marine in Vietnam, and and he didn't make it out of Vietnam, right? So I had a really unique perspective for that. And you know, like I said, I don't really talk about my personal life too much, but that led me on a road that was ultimately going to make me a Marine or die trying, right? So when I was talking about I did it for my own reasons, I did. But there's there's also a sense of when you're, when you, when you make that commitment to your country, right? You shouldn't be afraid being in your own country while you're making that commitment. That's what I found really completely, like, diametrically opposed to my beliefs. I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. Well, what? What here? Or there. Well, the thing that I heard about those guys just get get attacked right outside their barracks, and the guy oh, was yeah. I mean, it's just like, what the hell's going on? And then you hear people saying, "Hey, maybe you shouldn't wear a uniform. How about this? We keep those fucking guys off the streets. Maybe that would be a great way to start." You know? And yeah. I think we, we go about the problems the wrong way here. We're more reactionary, I think. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a uh, is he, he actually speaks volumes there. We're talking about in terms of how how far apart two countries can be in terms yeah. of. Perception, security, surroundings, culture. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about the USA mm-hmm. and the UK, mm-hmm. and that could be said for any country in Europe. Because, I mean, the USA is massive. It's just like you're there. It's who's a- gonna Who's gonna fuck with the USA, man? Right? It's very <laughs> just geographically yeah, strategically well, brilliant. Well, that was right. a great. That was a great idea up until 9/11, and then it was like, poosh, and then you know, you see how that thing just kind of turned out to be completely bananas as well. Yeah. Yeah, we could, we could go down a rabbit hole, yeah. Oh, shit. Let's not. Let's <laughs> <laughs> not. Um, tell me, mate, when did you start your U.S. Marines training? Can you tell me the process you went through to join up? Well, yeah, there was a lot leading up to me getting uh, to enlisting, right? And a lot of it was me getting in trouble as a kid, right? And I think I, when I mentioned before about my father, when you just have an idea of someone, you don't know them, right? But you know certain things about them. And one of the things was the the armed services. I felt that I had to kind of surpass what I thought he would be. And there's there's really no way to do that as a young man. I have a son who's eight, right? And I was about uh, I was about trying to be the best dad I could be for him, give him something to build a foundation on, right? I didn't have any of that, so I was kind of going off, doing my own thing, and getting in a lot of trouble doing it. But I think in the back of my mind, I always knew I was going to end up in the Marine Corps, right? So. I knew that things could get to a certain point and I could kind of like, you know, run in that little door and get in there. But when I first when I first went down to boot camp, I was completely unprepared for it. The night before I went, I watched Full Metal Jacket. So <laughs> Basics. Yeah, yeah. Basics. You know, I'm just like, what are you getting yourself into, man? So I watched Full Metal Jacket. I was like, well, I hope I never get to 3rd Battalion because they're the fucking wild ones out there. Because they called it, they, they were singing the Mickey Mouse theme because on Paris Island, there's 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, and and the rest of the, 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 the camp, because the Marines have camps, right, or around that area where the PX is and the chow hall and all that kind of shit. Then off in the freaking swamps was the third battalion right. and they used to call it disneyland because in disneyland <laughs> Mickey Mouse, yeah, yeah, right, in disneyland that. anything could happen right because you were i mean traditionally that was where all the crazy di's were because there weren't officers looking at you and there weren't people like watching you do what DIs, you're doing DIs. drill instructors yeah yeah drill instructors yeah <laughs> and you know so when i of course when i got in you know the minute the minute i got there they're like okay where's third battalion it was like no i'm not there but i'm sitting over here and they, they called me and i was like oh man I just watched this movie. It's fresh in my mind, right? I was expecting Arlie Emery to show up, right? And, uh, 
you know, you go in there and, and you... He was the DI. Uh, yeah, he was the dude right, who was... Who he was, was an the, actual drill instructor, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he was a gunny, yeah. yeah I mean, he yeah, was yeah. an actual gunny, but yeah, he yeah. passed away recently. But, you know, that dude, yeah. it, I mean, just that, that accent, you know, you're like... And I'm from New York City, right? So I never really traveled outside of New York City before. Next thing I know, I'm down in Beaufort, South Carolina. The world's different. It smells different. It's hot. It's April. It's like fucking hot. Everything's going ass backwards. I know that I'm better off here than where I would have been up in New York, so I'm kind of rolling with it. And I remember the first thing I realized is that they don't like what they call Yankees, right? And that's anybody born in the North. And they really fucking hate New Yorkers, right? So there was me and this kid, Alfred Molina. We were M, M-O, Morgan Molina. So we were always next to each other like, these fucking yeah, these, these Southern boys are just out there goddamn mind. So that cultural uh, disconnect was really manifested in the first couple weeks of boot camp when you get dropped in your platoon. And then I guess the the psychology of... of bring in a platoon together and making Marines is that you, you gotta, you gotta separate the you know, people from other people based on something that can't be racial or well, yeah, it can't be racial or you know, I was going to say sexual, but there's only men in the Marine Corps when I was there, they're women Marines, but it was a different thing. I didn't go there, but you couldn't do that because we were either dark green or light green. There was literally, th- that was, that was not a thing in the Marines, which I thought was really cool. There wasn't a rule ingrained racist kind of thing because you figure you're down south you're always looking out for that shit so what they do is they break you out uh, geographically so all the, all the Yankees I mean first of all I had an earring that got yanked out first day I was down I mean it was I went through some shit and it was I, you know I was kind of rolling with it because I was like well they, they can't really kill me can they well the thing is they can make you feel like you're dying right so you know what we have in the in the Marine Corps is it's the naval traditions allow us to have a quarter deck. And I don't know if you guys ever had that. That was an area in the squad bay where they'd take you and they'd just say, make a puddle. And, you know, it was dry. So you're like, what the fuck does make a puddle mean? And you just start doing push-ups. And you figure you're doing 20 and you're getting up, dropping every 20. No, nah, you're there for like seven, ten minutes. And you're just gunning them out. And I'm a young kid gunning them. I can do this. And there's fucking sweat coming off me. And there's a puddle eventually at the end of it. <laughs> So all Yankees make a puddle. It's like, oh, shit. And I wear that Yankee head proudly now because I earned it, right? So <laughs> down in down boot camp, they, that's what they try to do. So they kind of beat me down with that. And then I realized that, you know, you you, know, you kind of think why they're doing this. You just kind of put it all together in your own mind. But you really have no idea until you graduate. And then they realize, oh, you didn't want me. You didn't want me to be the weak link. And then you realize what it's all about. And then you become a Marine. And then you're part of that brotherhood. And that moves from there. But... That the first initial, oh, what the fuck are we doing down here thing was crazy. And also, 3rd Battalion, they have this thing called sand fleas down in North Carolina, South Carolina. And they're these little fleas that come up and bite you, and they're really terrible. And they have these sandboxes, these huge fucking sandboxes on Paris Island, right? And they stand everybody in their platoon in your underwear in the middle of the night, and these things are biting on you. And you're looking at the drill instructors, and there's like a, a halo of no bugs around them. Like, you could look at them, it's just no bugs. It bugs everybody, but they're not. You're like, what the hell is this all about? And also, they smell like prostitutes. You're like, what are these guys doing when they're not with me, right? And they're not beating the shit out of me. Why do they smell like hookers, man? Anyway, the minute you graduate, <laughs> they say, okay, Marine. You're like, what? And don't call me sir. I'm just a sergeant, all that kind of shit. And then they say, you got to go see the Avon lady. I'm like, what the fuck's the Avon lady? Like, the Avon lady, the skin's so soft, it's... it's and we're like, what's that? You got Avon in the USA as well. Yeah, man. Avon, Look at started Avon over ladies there. get everywhere, mate. Yo, Avon but, but ladies. You got no skin so soft, right? Yeah. Now, that shit is what every Marine puts on his bug spray. You smell like a prostitute, but no bugs bite you. <laughs> I, to this day, go on Amazon, <laughs> get, get that shit. If you ever go where there are bugs, just spray that shit on you. They leave you alone. They give a little halo, a little aura zone of no bugs, man. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take that tip out. Oh, no, really, man? Yo, skin so soft. If I could leave anybody with an impression, just get your get your skin so soft, man. Uh, right, so let's get it straight. Mm-hmm. You go to depot. Uh, you go to USMC trainer. Have you yeah. got a nickname for the Marine trainer? Well, it's, it's it? Paris Island is where I went. Paris There's one Island. out on San Diego. They call them California Marines, they, Hollywood Marines. So with us, so with... Uh, Anything in the British Army, really? You go to do a, you do a recruitment selection, or you do your like aptitude test, medical yeah, yeah, test, yeah. and thing. Then you yeah, re- re- yeah. yeah, recruitment selection test, mm-hmm. uh, recruitment selection like day, d- fucking run in, press up. Oh yeah, you got to do all that like shit that. before you actually go down. Like the, and, and the recruiters to, do that shit to you, and that's to see yeah. if you're going to get yeah. into training. Mm, maybe you should go to the navy. What, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. what did? Uh, what did you guys do before that? Or did you just go straight to depot? We, we, yeah, we just went running. I mean, you do a little stuff with your recruit. Is there a, a pre-selection? 
Not really. I mean, you have to do uh, you have to do the uh, you have to do the test, the ASVAB, right? So you go in there and do that, and if you do well, the mental test. Yeah, yeah the mental test. See if you're crazy or not, and if you're crazy, they're like Marines, right? Yeah. So a lot of the dudes I was in the Marines with, I was like, how'd you do in the test? Like, I don't know. And they ate a pencil. You know, you're like, oh, shit, how do these guys get it? <laughs> but, but it takes all kinds to be Marines. Right? You need a guy who's eating pencils and thinks it's good, you know. But yeah, you you finish that up, and then you, when they drop you into your platoon. Those guys have their own. I mean, a lot of different drill instructors, senior drill instructors, have their own program. They have to go by a certain kind of curriculum. Curriculum, but a lot of times, like our guy, uh, my senior drill instructor was uh, a Marine that was in that Beirut bombing where they lost oh, like, two hundred fifty Marines, oh, yeah. and he was like, "I'm not going to have any of these kids not being as tough as they possibly could." So he'd run us into the woods through all these brambles and stuff. I mean, he we'd come out just bloody. I mean, we'd wear like PT gear. We'd come out just be bleeding. Because he wanted us to be as tough as we possibly could. Because if we had to drag another Marine out of some shit, he didn't want us fucking that up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember. I, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You don't want to be that. You don't want to be that, that recruit. That well, that's, that's the thing you never want. And I guess it's probably the same with you guys, right? You don't want to be the guy that lets another guy down. And well, if you're a decent bloke, Huey. Yeah. I mean, well, if you've got any, anything about you, well, yeah. you, can, you, like, you can get dragged up through your, your childhood yeah. as you did yeah. you can get dragged up mate or you can get silver spoon fed mm -hmm. but if within you you've got that good person honest I, yeah. I've got empathy I, I, mm -hmm. look, you know, I can resonate with them I'm, mm -hmm. we've got an objective we want to achieve it you've got a bit of motivation in you yeah, yeah. but everyone's equal you know what I mean yeah. like what you're saying about US, US Marines and training you break everyone down everyone's yeah. fucking equal doesn't yeah. matter how much your parents got in the bank account doesn't yeah. matter what your background is mm -hmm. and, then, and then you see who the, 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 the men are and the boys mm -hmm. are you know what I mean and also, there's another thing that you can... The only thing I thought anybody took it easy on me well, is my mom used to send me care packages that had a lot of good food in it and stuff. And they opened up your care packages. And, then, and I remember getting called into the drill instructor's office at like midnight or something. And they're all fucking eating. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, your mom just sent this amazing stuff. And I was like... You know, you can't to the DIs. Yeah, but they, they get my package. They open it up. They start eating it. <laughs> and they're like, yo, Morgan, you know, can, can you just write your mother and tell her to send more stuff? I was like... Yeah, I guess I could do that. And I'm th I'm a New Yorker. I'm like, what do I get out of this uh, senior drill instructor? He was just like, you don't get your head cracked in. I was like, oh, all right, all right. <laughs> then we'll keep writing them letters to mom. But it, it was kind of interesting because it's true in the respect that you go through a lot of your life in in this kind of bubble of entitlement. Like, yeah, no one's gonna no one's gonna kick the shit out of me on a regular basis. Uh, you know, they're police that would would stop a crime. They're firemen that put out fires. There's all these, you know these societal, you know, infrastructure items that take care of our lives. But then you get to a certain extent where it's just all you, it's just on you. And that sense of responsibility was, I think, the most important thing I got out of that. I mean, it was to be res responsible for yourself and have self-discipline and all the things that I didn't think I even knew what they meant before I got in the service. Those things have helped me through my life immeasurably, man. Even just being aware of the impact that your actions can have on other yeah, people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you taught it in the military. In extreme case, your actions in a battle can have have impact the impact they can on other people. But that lesson carries on. Oh yeah. And for me, it did anyway, or it does. And it's the littlest things I do when I'm interacting with other people. The massive effect that can have on people, mm -hmm. negative or positive. Which it's just yeah. one of those. Everything you do matters. Every single thing you do matters. Doesn't mean I'm perfect, mind. I'm far from it. Oh, no, no. The, the, the thing is, if you have an idea that's greater than yourself, that's a great thing to have. If you, if you, the idea of yourself is always, you're always trying to get yourself to a certain point. You'll never get there. Obviously, you can't reach perfection. We're humans, right? But if you have an idea that's, you know, got social responsibility woven into it, and and self discipline, it can't be a bad thing. I don't think, you know. And I, I that's why I think a lot of the guys, there's a whole generation of guys that have been in Afghanistan and in Iraq, both of our countries, that are now coming out of the service with these traits that I guess historically have been part of our society. But lately, since the internet fucked everybody up, that wasn't a priority. People weren't trying to be socially responsible and weren't taking responsibility for their own actions. But you see a lot of that coming back in. Even with politics, you see like a couple guys, there's a, isn't there a guy, Mercer or something like that? He was on the podcast, Johnny Mercer, yeah. 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 Now he, he's, Good guy, mate. Yeah, right? And Unless I, you're gonna talk shit about him. No, 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 I'm not, no, <laughs> quite opposite, right? You know, I think, you know, I think that's, there was a book, Starship Troopers, right? And one, you know that crazy- I've seen one, the film. All right, the film's fucking stupid. Are they it? not US Marines in the film? 
the space marines and some shit, right? I, All I, the same thing, right? <laughs> yo, aliens had the space marines too. Now we got space force oh, over yeah, in America. Yeah, it could, space force, it could right? take it up to the next notch. I mean, what was that? We uh, should get back in. Yeah, well, yeah, for space. I mean, I don't have to carry shit. It's it's light, right? You know, zero gravity. I can carry that pack again. But there was a there was an idea in the book. I'm, I'm freaking who. I'm forgetting who wrote it. It wasn't Philip Dick, man. But the guy who wrote it had this idea that in the in the in the movie, remember that guy who was the who was the instructor and he was like the combat vet. He had the big yeah, scar yeah, across yeah, his face. Yeah. The idea is he was the only one that could vote because he actually had a I don't know I'm saying combat action room, but he actually served in combat for his world at that point. So if you do that, then you can vote. Uh, Up until then, you have no skin in the game, right? You're just you're just a bystander. You're just a, a civilian. But the fact that the idea behind that was the people that actually put their dicks on the line for the society should be the people that decide which direction that society goes in, right? And that's a, a kind of a weird idea. But when the guy wrote the book, it didn't seem like it was that far an idea. And this must have been like the 60s when he wrote it. So I think a lot of times, you know, Star Trek uses metaphors. I think that's what this guy did in his book. So the bugs were essentially the the godless communists or whatever, however he decided to page it, right? But it was an interesting concept that I remember reading that book as a young person and going, well, why does that guy get the vote and everybody else? And then it kind of dawns on you as you get older and things start, you know, really dropping into place like a Jenga or whatever, right? And you go, of course, yeah. I mean, the, if, you have, if you haven't really sacrificed for your society, you're kind of really not, you're not at liberty to decide which way it goes. You know, I mean, you see a lot of stuff with Brexit, and I try to stay out of the politics and stuff, right? Good luck with that. Yeah, man, but you see a lot of young people are like, yo, that's completely fucking crazy, right? Why would they do that? And then you see the older generation who they say those are the people who voted for Brexit. Well, they have they have a perspective that young people don't. It's called years on the block. And that's what we say in New York. How many years you got on the block? And if you have years on the block, that means you have experience and you have wisdom. Now, I'm not saying that they were wise to do it or unwise. I'm just saying that once a society starts starts treating the other side as less than human or less than, well, we were talking about empathy before. If you if you lack empathy at that point, everything just goes completely to the poles, and that's kind of what we got going on now. And you know those the, the people who are in the extinction rebellion. I mean, I'm all for it. I got young kids. I want the planet to be better. You know, I was the generation that started recycling and all that kind of stuff. You know, we used to use glass bottles and shit like that back in my day. So I understand that that's a big thing for for our next generation. But things get co opted, you know, and then people with their own agenda, you know, want to do things that can fall under that umbrella, and that's where you get a lot of time. Mm, mm. But uh, I, may be, I mean, people might be coming at you after hearing me talk about this Starship Troopers thing, go, Huey's out of his mind. Yeah, I am fucking out of my mind. I've never said I wasn't. I just play music, man. You know, I, I don't think I'm the most stable person I know. I don't think I ever will be, and I think that's a good thing. I think I like being a little bit, a little bit rattly like an old car but it's a nice old car but it's still a little bit rattly not everything fits together perfectly anymore but that's that's getting older too when you're younger you're very confident how things fit together because your body fits together perfectly and your mind is kind of still young and learning so it's still together the older you get the more things get more complicated and there's more gray there's less black and less white so that's what i think i am now so well, why why <clears throat> Define stable though. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I might, I might be stable, mate. Do you know what? One of the things I thought, uh, 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 I thought about last year, it popped in my head, right? And it's a, <laughs> so it just popped in my head when you were talking about the, your lack of stability here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think anybody who wore uniforms got a little something to say. Imagine everything was the same, man. How crap would life be? Man, it'd be like a film where you know, everyone's a robot and just yeah. doing the same shit, man. Mm -hmm. It'd be like the worst example of humanity ever, yeah. right? You need variation. And absolutely, the most brilliant, the most brilliant people in the world. Ah, uh, they they've there's a, there's a streak to them, right? There's mm -hmm. a wild streak to them. Be them fighters, be them musicians, be mm -hmm. them flipping politicians, be them whatever, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at Trump. <laughs> yeah. Mental, yeah. mental. But you like, know, there is brilliance in yeah. there somewhere, right? He's just not putting it to the correct use. Yeah, man. Right? I, like some, you know, because I'm American, right? A lot of people say, "Oh, tell me about this Donald Trump guy." Like I fucking know him because I'm from the same city as him, right? But I kind of think I do because when I was growing up, he was everywhere. But the one thing that I, I don't see that a lot of other people see is this overt racist type of thing. I mean, I, I, you know. We, oh, with when, him? With him, yeah. Because when I was growing up, he was getting like the NAACP award. He was hanging out with all the What's ball. the NAACP? It's the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People in America. It's a, it's a, 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 
I'd say it's a black American kind of uh, organization that helps the advancement of black Americans. And he got the Rosa Parks Award a couple of times. And before he was president, he was like one of the most quoted names in hip hop. I mean, everybody loved him. But the problem is perception, right? We're talking about perception. This guy gets what's, asked. What, what's the, what, sorry. Well, my, my, my idea is like when people ask me about him, like, what do you think? And I was like, well, I know what I know about him, but I don't know the man's heart. But I also know that when I get on a plane, I root for the pilot. You know, I want that plane. To, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I don't have to know what's in the pilot's heart to root for the pilot to land the plane. Well, this is, there's two things in there. It's, mm. it's a media problem, it's a politician's problem. Yeah. Our perception of what's going on in the world is down to the media, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and the media's, and the, and the way the media, um, uh, I'm, I'm conscious he worked for the BBC, and the way the so media. So am I, bro. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Shit. And the way the media. Painfully conscious sometimes. And, yeah. the, and the way the media, um, my opinion. Uh, convey things to the public. It all depends on which side of the fence they're aligned with and how politicians themselves are presenting the information. Mm -hmm. Let's go back. I mean, look, Trump. Trump's uh, no. Let's go back to Brexit. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning there about uh, about um, the perception mm -hmm. that the majority of people who voted for Brexit were the older generation. The majority mm -hmm. uh, in the, the in the sticks too. Old generation living on farms and little villages going. We don't want those, people we who don't voted for yeah. Remain. Yeah. With the younger generation, that's fucking incorrect. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, like, it's, it's how you present data. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incorrect, right? So the majority of people who voted, let's ignore which side they voted for, mm -hmm. the majority of people who voted were the old generation. Yeah. No, young kids don't fucking vote. <laughs> that's like, kind of true, like, If right? you looked at the, the scale of ages, it'll be like 25, 26, 27 and up. Mm -hmm. And that's the majority of people who voted. But you could say that between the ages of 18 and let's say 25, the majority of those people, even though they're a minority of people who voted, the majority yeah. of those people voted for, for Remain. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the majority of young people voted for Remain. It doesn't. It, it's just fucking mental. It is. It breaks crazy. me. It breaks me. Yeah. Um, what it really means is who's got a clue on what is really going on? Well, it's who's also this, clue? there are two no medias, one. aren't there? I mean, you know, you, when I first came to England, I was in a taxi and I was talking to this guy, he was a black dude, and we were talking about newspapers and, and things like, I don't know how, it got, oh, we were talking about red tops and blue tops, and I didn't know the difference. So he was telling me red tops are like the sun and the Starks, they have the red banner on the top, and the blue tops are like the, the Times and the Guardian, all that kind of thing. And he was saying, well, I remember my dad, we were talking about some stuff, and he goes, I remember my dad reading this very right-wing newspaper, right? And I, I remember his friends going, yo, why are you reading that? And he goes, well, I know what I think but I want to know what they think, right? Which is kind of the idea behind this whole two medias, the perception and how things are very polarized. You want to know what other people think. And it's funny because a lot of people who are traditionally, I'm a New York liberal lefty guy, right? So I'm kind of confused how far things have gotten out of control on the left, right? And it's because those people live in this echo chamber and they don't see, they don't want to know what the other people think because they don't even think those other people are people. And the same thing goes for, I think, on a lot of, in America, it's very polarized. Now, I was there recently, and it's just kooky, man. But you notice that the, some people who just don't want to know, they're never going to want to know, right? So they're always going to be kind of stuck off in, on, the, on the, the outer fringes, like skirting the map. And that's why I think the problem lies that, especially with like, you know, you look on social media and Twitter and stuff, it seems that that's like the worst people can act towards one another, right? Because when I first started on Twitter, I made a bunch of mistakes, man. I'm a dude who drinks white wine on an empty stomach and talks some shit. But on Twitter, it just hits everything. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, I, I also come from a generation that that was not how you converse with people. You didn't speak that way to people. For, for lack of a better reason, you might get slapped in the mouth, right? So I had to take a step back from that whole thing and be like, this is not for me. And like, I have a Twitter account, but that's not me. <laughs> you know, that's somebody else doing that thing, man. And that's good. It's, good. it's just letting people know what I do. Because whenever, whenever that kind of situation happens and people are just the worst they can possibly be to one another, nine times out of 10, it's happening on Twitter, right? It might happen on some other social network, but I think in a lot of ways, Twitter is one of the things that has fucked up this planet in the last 10 years beyond that you could possibly think like a, like a, a, a fucking pathogen or a virus that could kill a, a bunch of people. Like if Ebola got released, I mean, we'd probably do less damage than what Twitter's done in the long term, I think. One of the things that, one of the things I've noticed with Twitter, interesting you've been, uh, one of the things I've noticed with Twitter, so I, I've been on and off it for years, never really on it for any mm -hmm. 
Remember that movie? Do you remember Jay and Silent Bob? Those two dudes that made yeah. that movie, right? So they remember that one time where they went around the movie. Are you uh, Leg Lover sixty five? Yeah, boom! They punched the dude out because that's how I felt when people would diss me on Twitter. I'm like, I'm gonna find this motherfucker. Yeah, but don't respond to it. Don't. No, but, but, but I come from a different generation. This is years ago when I first got on Twitter. I was like. How dare that motherfucker, right? And but now, obviously, I've learned to kind of realize that it's just knuckleheads being in their mom's basement who don't know the touch of a woman, getting really angry at me or something. You know, <laughs> it's not a bad thing either because yeah. when you get a hater come out on you, <laughs> it's kind like, of funny, you're gonna get ten of your ten of your supporters come uh, out and give them shit. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, but, I, I always like seeing people have little scraps on a keyboard. You know, that's, yeah. that's kind of funny. It's interesting we mentioned about Twitter though. Mm -hmm. So Facebook used prolifically. Obviously, I actually now almost completely cut it out. Yeah. I, I monitor it mm -hmm. sort of, but. Well, Zuckerberg monitors it well. You know. Zuckerberg <laughs> monitors it, mate. Um, Instagram, mm -hmm. started using that really good. Mm -hmm. Twitter, started, I really like Twitter. However, in line with that, what you're saying, I cannot believe how much negative negative mm -hmm. it is. I, and also, that I, I went into it, and I, I was like conscious of it. Mm -hmm. Right, really negative. No, positive, positive. Po keep everything, keep, keep everything positive. Man, you yeah. start going down a slope. It's yeah, like man. Jesus. Yeah. And I, I caught myself a couple of times writing some negative. And I'm just writing, just, just slating people. Yeah. Not slating people. Just don't writing argue negative with, stuff. Don't argue with a the fool. They'll drag like, you down your le their level, man. It's, yeah. it's something about the nature of that medium, the restriction in characters, the mm. way you communicate. It draws negativity. It's well, it's unbelievable. Also lack of nuance. Uh, the anonymity of it. It's like the way human beings over the last, you know, 50,000 years have learned to communicate. That shit threw out the window in 10 years. Like, we used to actually look each other in the eye when we spoke to one another. We'd have respect for people because I don't know what kind of life you live in if I meet you on the street. The thing is, those kind of niceties, those those social graces, if you want to go that far on calling that, are just, it's not part of our society anymore. And it's, it's really strange. Like, I don't... I don't think I don't mean I don't have Twitter on my phone. I don't have Instagram on my phone. I don't have any of that shit on my phone because I'll I'll end up like getting getting something going. Oh, you know, I'm doing this really cool radio show about this tomorrow. Boom, boom, boom. Someone's like, "Fuck you and your fucking radio show," and <laughs> "Fuck that." And you're just like, "Yo, what the, well, yeah, it's just one guy." Then another guy, "Fuck him, he's right." <laughs> fuck, and you're just like, "Who are these people, man?" Like, are you waiting on the edge? To get, you know, with a hair trigger ready to just go off on anything that you don't... Ricky Gervais said, I think, best. He goes, all right, so it's like going... He's amazing. He, I did a podcast with him. And he did fucked, you? You should get him well, on. His he, podcast. No, I did. I had a podcast for a little while. And then I just... I, I got to the point where I was just talking to, like, Big Phil Campy and stuff like that. And people were like, you know, Huey, man, you out there with these crazy military motherfuckers. It's crazy. I was like, well, that's what I'm interested in. Like, no one else is, bro. <laughs> anyway, so I had <laughs> Ricky Gervais on, but he was funny. But he said something in his recent comedy thing that I think is hilarious. It's like, you go to a mall and you put up guitar lessons and you put the numbers right there. Twitter is like someone going, I don't want any fucking guitar lessons calling you up. I don't want any fucking guitar lessons. And you're like, well, you could have just not, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's it, it's this weird kind of like, you know, idea of how to navigate in the world. It's just, it's not, it's not, it's not coherent to me. I just don't get it. Yeah, it's bullshit. You see that? There's a thing going around on, on oh man, was it Instagram today? I don't know. Well, I got in something. trouble on Instagram the other day. I w I'm a BMX rider. I ride bikes all the fucking time. Me and my son, BMX till I die, right? I, I, you know those dudes who wear the helmets and the, and, the, and the tight clothes that do the Tour de France shit that aren't in the Tour de France? Yeah, those guys, right? So they get really <laughs> upset, right? <laughs> they get really upset if you diss that whole cycling shit at all, right? I know people don't know that I BMX. Well, they might. I don't know. I put it in videos and shit. I have my, one of my best friends who's my radio producer. He bikes all the time. So I thought it was funny. Like these dudes are pointing. I'm like, hey, let's go ride in the middle of the road like assholes, right? And the guy's pointing, yo. People came out of woodwork telling me, yo, fuck you, Huey. We're not listening to any anything you do anymore. I was like, wow, dude, you don't even. You, it's just like people are ready to just assume the worst of somebody because they're conditioned to expect the worst out of everybody. And everyone looks at. If you got a different... It was a fucking joke, <laughs> right? right, right. right? And I, I made fun of The Cure, which apparently is a bad thing to do, too. And all the goths just came at me, bro. They're like, yo, why, fuck why, you. Why did you make fun of The Cure? I saw a picture of Robert Smith, right? And I like The Cure. I'm not against The Cure, but it was fucking funny. And it said, <laughs> The Cure, question mark, 
some like you know the disease like look the if that's the cure the disease is probably better whatever it was some kind of play on the name of the band right <laughs> it's a fucking joke it's like 11 o'clock at night i'm like all right boing and then like yo every goth in the world has got that big fucking you know black maltese falcon chip on their shoulder we're like get him and they just, <laughs> they just came out of the woodwork and i was like wow i made every goth in the world really angry for like 10 seconds but the, I realized that God's angry anyway. So all I did was just come on their radar for a second. But it was just hilarious how everybody is just so willing to think the worst of you. Like people are like, oh, Huey, you're a fucking horrible human being for making fun of Robert Smith. I was like, well, first of all, it's a joke. Second of all, I didn't make fun of him. I just saw this picture that looked kind of funny and I put it up there. And third of all, fuck you. <laughs> you know. And that's kind of how I have to look at social media right now. I can't really... I think shit's funny, but some people might not because they don't have my life experience. They don't. They didn't live my life. They lived their own life. So yeah, I have. I have a inner. I have a inner beast in my head. <clears throat> and if I say so, so sometimes I'll do inappropriate jokes at the wrong times. <laughs> I say sometimes. I say well, regularly. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, me wrong too, people. Me too. I've had some right dramas, but then and I'll sometimes I'll do it online or, or whatever. And in my head, <clears throat> if there's a bit of neg- negative feedback in my head, it'll be fuck. Off <laughs> in my head, I'm in their face going, Fuck uh, yeah, off. Yeah. Every right to be offended, be offended, it's fine. But yeah. Jesus Christ, if you're offended, fuck off somewhere else. Well, but isn't everybody offended about something? It, it's it's it, crazy it, it, on, the, on the it's social crazy. networks. I mean, if you see people in real life, people in real life are completely different than that. I mean, probably the people who are assholes on the social networks are really really timid in real life and probably don't get to tell people to, that they're horrible human beings because they can't bring themselves to look another person in the eye and, and do all that shit so behind the keyboard warrior shit well this is an interesting point here's, here's, a, here's a consideration <clears throat> so the way social media is is that you know e- e- <clears throat> or the way well, isn't, only- well I'll tell you I don't mean to interrupt you but I am <laughs> But, but don't you think <laughs> and I find this like Facebook and the Twitter stuff between veterans is a lot more civil even if they disagree, like, you know, dudes on Instagram put up some, like, picture of a Navy SEAL with his face all done out, and he's got, like, a, 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 a some kind of patch, and they're like, that's not a real Navy SEAL patch, and they just go back and forth, but they don't call each other cocksuckers, you know, they're just, they're not, they're not going, oh, you fucking cocksucker, they, they're kind of like, hey, no, actually, that's not, in 2004, this unit was wearing that patch, and it's kind of nerdy, but it's respectful to a certain degree, and I'm like, well, see, there's motherfuckers who have a little bit of, can't, they, they, they can, they can communicate with each other without being nasty to each other. Mm-hmm. I see that with veterans because I think, you know, there's, there's something in common with people who had to, because we had to live with people that we didn't like, right? We had to learn to live and thrive with people we didn't know and didn't like and this some people thing, we right? did like, you know? It's tolerance. <clears throat> but it's, yeah. right, so it, there's an interesting word, tolerance, mm-hmm. re, especially in recent times. So be tolerant of, of other cultures. and you know, Well, no, it's not. <clears throat> tolerance is a two-way thing or mm-hmm. a three-way thing or a four-way thing or yeah. kind of 30-man thing or whatever yeah. between you're in. And it goes, and it's not about um, completely being, it's not about completely being accepting of what the other people the other person, let's say just you and your oppo. Say you mm-hmm. and another. Uh, what's your nickname for U.S. Marines? Leathernecks. Yeah, Leathernecks. Uh, Devil Dogs. That was a big one. Devil. Devil yeah. Dogs. Yeah, yeah. When we were fighting the French in World War One, or fighting with the French, I mean, yeah, the Germans were like, "These guys fight like dogs from the devil." Yeah, that's pretty alley, yeah. mate. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty, yeah. yeah. Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> you were saying uh, uh, about how... Oh, yeah, it's not about like to- uh, 100% tolerating what the other person or other people do. It's about... It's it's about learning to cope with what they do. Yeah, yeah. But getting the both best the relationship for both. And it's a two-way thing because the other person's doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. You're completely different. That's how the opportunities get by. One of the things that I realised when you were talking about US Marines and one of the things that's uh, particular to the, the parachute regiment mm-hmm. and some other units within the British forces is that we don't have a catchment area. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's common to other units in America and the, in the States, uh, but like here you have like uh, the Duke of Lanx regiment. Yeah. Well, you do if it's if you're in uh, a reserve unit because then you'd have to, that town and that area would have its own reserve unit. Right. So like a state uh, yeah, National yeah, yeah. Guard kind of thing. So yeah. you, you have like Duke of Lanx yeah. a regiment for, mm-hmm. as an example. Sorry, any Duke of Lanx listening, but as an example, so the majority of those people are from Funny enough, Lancashire area. Yeah, yeah. And so inevitably what you get is a lot of people with very, very similar views mm-hmm. from political to, you know, what's uh, yeah, what's acceptable treatment of a woman. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I'm just, <laughs> yeah. I'm, no, I, it's, everything's, it, I'm but, not insinuating yeah. people from Lancashire. <laughs> I'm just, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right? And, and uh, but with 
units that have with with units that have no catchment area, mm-hmm. they are, they benefit from a huge amount of variety of cultures, mm-hmm. background from the countries. Well, that's kind of how we are. I mean, the Marines. It's like either on the East Coast and then you go to Paris Island. If you're kind of west of Chicago, you probably go to San Diego. But with that, it, there's no kind of like you know catchment area. So you, I was with guys that I I had zero in common with. But after three months on Paris Island, you got everything in common with them. You know, you, you you become brothers despite the fact that you're completely different. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. mate, the most the most the most capable teams in the world, whether it's in a company, whether it's in a charity, whether it's a sports team, they have a, a broad range of backgrounds, mm-hmm. broad range of skills. Mm-hmm. If everyone's got the same fucking skill, you can achieve one thing really well, but you don't achieve the aim. Yeah, you know? more brains, more results. That's what I always thought. Yeah, exactly. Tell me how you got into right. Fun loving criminals. That, How that, did we did you, did you start that? What where did that come from? Well, I I played guitar when I was a kid. I apologize if you told this story many times. Before. No, 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 it's cool. I, I'll I'll do an abbreviated, abridged version. I played guitar when I was a kid. I enlisted, and then I was down south, and I played rock and roll and blues and stuff growing up. And then I learned about country music and a little bit more jazz stuff. So I would have the guitar around, uh, you know, in the barracks and stuff. And where if we get gone, I'd bring a guitar. And it was cool because a lot of other people play guitar. So I'd learned from all these other dudes how to play different styles of guitar. And if you listen to Fun Loving Criminals music, it could be whatever the song demands. It could be jazz. It could be rock. It could be hip hop. It could be funk. Anything really, right? So that's one of the things I think that made me uh, really think that the Fun Loving Criminals could do something. Also, when I got out of the Marines, I didn't want to wake up early ever again, right? So I got a job at the Palladium nightclub. In New York City, right? I walked in off the street. And I was that's a big, that's a, yeah, it was a, a big famous nightclub. Yeah, right? and it yeah. was owned by these, this one guy. And he owned the the Limelight, the Palladium, and uh, the Tunnel, right? So these three nightclubs, right? So I go walk off the street, and you know, I'm talking to some cute girl who's the receptionist. She's like, you know, fill out this thing. What have you been doing for the last couple? Years? I was out in the Marines. She's like, all right, wait here. She went and got like the manager of the club. He comes down. He's like, yo, fuck, man, what are you doing? I was like, look, I just need a job. And he's like, well, you start tonight, right? So. I started working at this nightclub as a busboy, picking up cups and shit. The first night when I was working, it was Parliament Funkadelic. Just like imagine Parliament Funkadelic. I I hadn't been stoned in seven years. <laughs> I'm smoking weed, watching Parliament Funkadelic play. Going, my goodness, the world has turned for me. <laughs> so from then on out, I kind of wanted to do something music, right? Because I thought that I wanted to. I thought that that's what I I could offer, right? You know, I I, I was a good Marine, but I thought that. I had a little bit more creatively to offer the world, right? So it wasn't anything lofty. I didn't think I wanted to be, you know, a Grammy Award winning musician or anything like that. I just wanted to kind of do something I felt good in my heart doing. And if I could do that and make a little money, pay the rent, that's cool, right? So then I started this band. And I was working at a nightclub, and the guy Fast, who's still in the band with me, my, my brother, my partner, he was like the receptionist. and oh, the Palladium. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Limelight, please hold, you know, whatever it was, you know. And he had a really funny job because he was the receptionist and they used to have a hip-hop night at the tunnel, right? And that place was fucking crazy. It was on the West Side Highway. It was nuts, right? All the hip-hop dudes would roll in there. I'd just speak Spanish the whole time. I was bartender by then. I'd be like, ¿Qué pasa? They wouldn't even want to speak English to these dudes, right? And everybody had guns, everybody, right? So one of the funniest things is there was a clap, clap, clap outside because there was always a clap, clap, clap outside all the security guys would run in and be like, oh, fast. And he'd hold his shirt out like this and they'd just start dropping pistols into his shirt. Nah. And he'd have like third, 13 pistols. And like, <laughs> okay, hide those because the cops would roll in at that point. So he'd have to kind of walk into the back room and just stay in the back room until the, the cops left. So crazy days, man. Yeah. And then, all right, so. Anyway, so then he and yeah. I started, we started, we became roommates. We, a friend of ours, a uh, mutual friend introduced us. We became roommates he was in a band doing a, song, a band called Moses on Acid, which is a great name for a band, right? Uh-huh. But it was like electro disco stuff. It was like hip hop beats sped up, right? And one of the things I noticed when he was programming some stuff, he was using like hip hop beats, but then he go boom, 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 and like kind of turn the the tempo up. And I was like, yo, 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 he's back, flock of seagulls. Let's get this thing. Where it's, <laughs> you know, from you know, Pulp Fiction, man. You know, I'm like, yo, and he had that kind of hair too at the time. So I was like, he's back, flock of seagulls, and. We kind of slowed the beats down. I was like, have you ever heard of Van Halen? And so I started playing like guitar stuff. And we started mixing like, you know, that kind of like classic rock with hip hop beats. And then also, you know, the idea of sampling at that point, we were really into movies. So we were using like the, the Pulp Fiction samples and the Reservoir Dog samples. Why did you, right, I know you fucking 100% been asked this before, but tell me, why did you use the Pulp Fiction sample? The idea of the song 
was a drug-induced bank robbery. And in our minds, we were watching a lot of the Reservoir Dogs movies and, and Pulp Fiction. And we figured if we were going to try to, if we were trying to tell a joke, we want people to understand the framework of that joke. So if you can try to tell a story, you want people in on the basic idea. So we thought if we use the samples that everybody knows and if they immediately go, oh, it's like a fucking Tarantino movie but a song, you know, <laughs> it, it seemed like it worked, right? The funny thing is we sampled Tarantino and he's like, uh, you know, you got to give me some of this. Or his lawyer said, you got to give me some of the, the, the music publishing. And we're like, all right. But Quentin had to actually start a production company to get our money. And like to this day, we're still boys. And he actually, he made some good money off me. And I, I think it's kind of funny because it was one of those things he's like, why did you sample my movies? And we're like, dude, because your movies are fucking great. And <laughs> it, it let us all in on that kind of film noir music thing. I mean, it was, we always use a lot of film ideas for the music, right? And I think that just comes with, you know, watching movies and things like that and being a big movie fan. So I think that's how The Fun Living Criminal started in New York. And we didn't, we weren't looking for a record deal. We were just dicking around. We made a cassette tape and we gave it to a DJ who worked at the Limelight to play because he, he's like, you guys got any of that crazy ass music? And made a cassette. And then he gave that cassette to somebody at EMI because he was a scout, but we didn't know that. And then a like a year and a half later after playing at the club maybe five or six times and people would cancel, like an opening band would cancel. They was like, all right, guys, go get your shit. Punch out. <laughs> so you're not getting paid. Punch out. Go get your guitars. Come back, do the show, and then punch back in and finish the night. So we were opening up for like... Fuck yeah. We opened up for uh, Corn. We opened up for the Sugar Hill Gang, Run DMC. I mean, we were just out So there. you'd be like on the door... Mm -hmm. And they'd say, at the bar, at like the bar. the bar, putting ice and putting the juices in the collecting thing. empty glasses. Yeah, and they're like, and they dude, go, dude yeah. like, get, like, get, band cancelled. You got get, ten minutes. Band cancelled. Yeah. Get your kit, and mm -hmm. then after you've done the set, you're back yeah. in collecting yeah. glasses. And they didn't have to pay us either. Yeah, <laughs> so that was how we did that. So over the like six gigs, over like a year and a half, this this friend of ours who was the DJ was kicking it to this guy Mike Schnapp, who ended up signing us to EMI, and it was just really trippy because we we didn't think what we were doing was commercially viable at all and we still don't but you know 10 million records later this guy mike schnapp knew that he's because he he was a real rock dude he uh he was one of the dudes that was helping ozzy osbourne when he first got back out of uh, oh, okay. when when sharon busted him out and he did blizzard of oz and all that all the crazy train shit yeah. and he he was one of the guys that signed pearl jam i mean this dude knew his shit and the record company that we were at emi he was the head head A and R guy, vice president of A and R. So he kind of had a lot of sway. So that's how we got our deal. We got an eight record deal. And we ended up producing our own music as well. So it was crazy. And that was times when, you know, you get two fifty a record, right? Two pound, two dollars fifty cents a record. And the records were like sixteen bucks, right? The CDs or whatever at the time. It's dog shit these days. Though. You know, you, you. I don't know how people make money doing it, man. Crazy. It, it? Well, that's why you get a bunch of B type personalities making music now. It's because it's not, it's not the. It's not the pinnacle anymore of creative endeavors, you know. The the, <clears throat> the way you make money these days is, I would argue, the best way to make money these days is is a social media presence. Yeah, I nick phones. I, I nick you, phones from people. You, you, like all the people walk down. I I'm, nick phones. Steal phones. Yeah, yeah. Nick people, phones. Yeah, you see like the tourists walking through like this. You just go snatch. That's that new iPhone. Snatch. Right, that's the New Yorker coming out. Yeah, you grab ten of them. That's like six grand. <laughs> Think about it, bro. Well, I, I, <laughs> I'm playing, by the way. No, it's like ten grand. You didn't use well, nine grand. Didn't not everybody's got my phone. <laughs> <laughs> my phone's in my fucking pocket. I don't pull that right, shit out in the okay, street. Well. Question for you. Yeah. Uh, going back, would you? No, not going back. No. If you're, you, you got a boy. Yeah, I got a so, boy and a girl. Boy and a girl. Okay, yeah. cool. Would if either of them want to join the military? Well, what do you reckon? Uh I know. I struggle with this question as well. It, it's interesting. Because the reason I join the Marines wouldn't be the reason my son or my daughter would join the Marines. Do you know what unit your dad was? Huh? Do you know what unit your dad was? He was in 2nd Marine Division. I know that he... Oh, was a Marine as well? Yeah. Okay. He was, and I know that he was uh, initially in 0311 and then started doing some reconnaissance stuff. So, I mean, yeah, it was pretty crazy. And from what my mom tells me, it wasn't he wasn't that great when he came back the first time and he went back a couple more times, so... Yeah, it, no, but it, it you know, right. but I mean, I don't know. Do you come from a military family? Or are you the first one? First. Yeah. So when you come from a military family, I guess it's a little bit different. But remember, I didn't have any any contact with my dad. I didn't even know him, right? So I was just kind of looking at this this fictitious kind of monolith of, a, and just trying to try to emulate or better that in my own mind. So I don't know if if my kids, 
wanted to, they probably would have a good reason. Cause just wanted to aspire to something. You don't know what the, what the aspiration, what the the, 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 the target is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, you you got kids too, right? Yeah. I got two girls. Two girls. All right. So you probably just being around them has let them know what it's like to be in the service. I mean, just because the way your personality is different, the way your social responsibility level is a little bit higher. I see what you do. You know, you do good things. These 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 kids of yours are really going to see a dad and, and respect you and love you for that and the things that you do. So I think that might, it might, like I said before, their reasons for joining, if they were to join, would be very different from ours. You know, mm-hmm. they'd be, you know, like, very different, I think. Especially nowadays, it's, it seems like, I don't know what a, a conventional army or military would be in the next 20 or 30 years, right? It's going to be a bunch of those fucking robots running around with, you know, lightsabers or some shit. Fucking okay, Boston Dynamics. Oh God. Boston Dynamics. I you watch that. If you, want, yeah, if, you want, if you want nightmares at night. The thing that spins around. Does it, I was like, all you got to do is give it a fucking samurai sword. We're all dead, bro. Or do the you, two ones that, that kind of like open the door for each other. Do you listen to the Joe Rogan podcast? Yeah, yeah. yeah I like Mate, that, yeah. have you heard him talking about, was it him talking about it? Where they've developed, the, it wasn't him, but they developed a robot and this robot survives on biofuel. And you go, right, what do you mean biofuel? Right, well, it can feed off the enemy dead and that's what powers it. Hang on a minute. Hang on, let's just peel it. That's the end of the human race. That's, that's fucking Terminator, right? That's that race. old shit, man. We got to go back <laughs> in time and clip that dude who invented that shit. It kills you and eats you and then cracks on. No battery pack, no battery <laughs> charger, mate. You remember, <laughs> did Elon Musk say that that's what's gonna, it's going to kill us, all these fucking robots and the AI? And everybody yeah. thinks he's a smart cat, so. Yeah, he's also bonkers. I mean, the thing is, people get confused between AI and AGI, right? Yeah. And, uh, I am too. I, I, artificial intelligence you're learns. confused. Yeah, well, I don't know what AGI is. What's AGI? What's the difference between the two? So AI is uh, artificial intelligence is where uh, it's, it's learning, but you've got you to feed it information. Yeah. So you've got to give it the tool. You've got to give it a, a certain set of, fuck, I'm, I'm probably talking shit here, but you've got to give it a certain set of information. And then it takes that information and, and makes a deduction from it. Okay. And then, depending on the outcome of the de- de- depending on the outcome of whatever action it takes, it then learns that action. Goes, oh, if I do that and that happens, then and it can predict the next movement. Oh, okay. That's AI. AGI is AGI is uh, is minimal input and me looking at that board over there mm-hmm. and going, okay, so there's a podcast going on now and two people are talking at the microphone and there's cables there and it says on it pre mm-hmm. and pre is a is a, um, uh, obviously an audio uh, hardware company and one of them says uh, mic in and one of them says uh, monitor out and okay, so I can induce that. Blah, blah, blah. It, it's that understanding. So it doesn't need it's to be programmed. Your, it fucking learns. It, that's, that's age. That's, yeah. It's basically that's what we are. That's what we do, man. You know, I, I, we look at, I look at that. So I look at that black thing now, mm-hmm. and, and I go, okay, what is that? Well, it's gonna, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a. It'll take in the consideration in a recording studio. Uh, it's probably something having to do with sound, right? So we'll deduce all that kind of shit. The temperature's warm in here. That's like the end. It looks like it blows out air, so it must be a cooling, cooling unit. <laughs> Right? That's AGI. We're it's, all it's fucked, that. man. Maybe we're we fucked. should get our kids in the fucking military, man. <laughs> Honest to God. <laughs> yeah, you see things like that, right? And you see, like, their advancements in in militaries every, you know, every 20 or 30 years. I mean, we're still flying those F-15s that are, like, from when I was a kid, right? But the, I guess the 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 exponential growth of of computer science and all that stuff, where you, I mean, Back in the day, you know, the, the phones that we have, you know, the the computer power they used to land on the moon is like one quarter of what's in some of the shittiest phones, right? So imagine how these things are going to be in the next 20 years. I mean, it's kind of scary for guys our age. I mean, I'm 51, right? So I'm thinking, shit. In yeah. My, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking in my lifetime, I mean, I look at, I still look at my iPad on my iPhone and be like, this is fucking great. You know, I'm still that guy, right? <laughs> I'm still that dude because I remember the fucking black and white TV, man. I remember, I have a picture my mom sends me every once in a while, like, well, they just had the moon landing anniversary. Me sitting in front of a black and white TV with Neil Armstrong holding up the flag or some shit. That's me, right? So I'm thinking anything that's not made out of a tube is pretty amazing, yeah, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. But kids, you see how young kids, they just look at it as a tool. My kid knows the four-finger program swipe on an iPod. I'm like, how? Because oh, yeah. it, that's just how you do shit. It's, they, the novelty of it is gone, right? For them, there is no novelty to it. It's as, 
it's as uh, as utilitarian as a toothbrush. It's they just that's how you do shit. Give your kids a Nokia 3210 <laughs> with the buttons. They don't know how to work oh, yeah. it. They don't know how to work it. <laughs> yeah. They've got no idea. They've got no idea. But I mean, going back, I, I've sort of, <clears throat> I've gone, I've gone through a divorce. And so, and, and that, and, sim- and similarly with my military service, it's sort of, it's really had a massive impact in the way I think. I used to be really dis- disciplinarian mm-hmm. in loads of different ways. And now I'm, Especially with the kids, I want to go to college, university, bah, 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 bah. Mm. and now I'm like, through my own realization, it's it's like w- w- one of the things I realize is you were best at what you were good at. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, rephrase that. You're best at what you enjoy. Yeah. yeah. So now my meet the kids is, you want to, you know, you want to you want to do religious education for a GCSE? I'm gonna I'm gonna you know, put my hair in my hands, but yeah. you crack if that's what you enjoy, mm-hmm. you crack on. Yeah, because yeah. at the end of the day, I just want my Not kids to my be kids happy. Do that. Well, I'm just saying, I just want my kids to be happy, right? I, the whole idea of going to school, I mean, I didn't go to college. You know, I, I came from very humble beginnings, and I know my kids have a lot more advantages than I do, right? And I want them to utilize that, but they're going to be who they are, right? I mean, it's just kind of how it is being a parent. You learn that as they get older. How old are your daughters? Uh, good, uh, good, good question. T- 10 and 14. Ooh, 14, huh, dude? Mm. My yeah. boy's eight, my girl's four, and I'm I'm already getting these vibes. I'm like, oh shit, there's gonna be trouble in the house. Yeah. <laughs> my eldest is fourteen, and she did not she did not fall off the ugly tree and hit every branch down. I'm telling you, it's a fucking nightmare. Yeah. yeah, it's a fucking nightmare. But I think having kids, I mean, it's also. I was talking to somebody about having kids the other day, and he doesn't have kids, and he was like, "What, what is what is it? What does it boil down to?" And I said, "Well, you realize that they will outlive you, so you're giving them." enough common sense to take them into that next generation when you're not going to be around. That's why I guess being a parent is because common sense isn't that common, right? And you see a lot of people walking around with their heads in their ass. And in London right now. Yeah, it's it's literally, literally, right, literally right outside. <laughs> man. Now, I don't, I don't want people thinking that I'm against uh, the whole climate thing. We were talking about that on the way in. I just think that, you know, when you get a bunch of middle class people with like, you know, $50,000, uh, you know, costumes doing stuff, it kind of takes the, it takes the authenticity of it away. And I think that's what people... Are, are kind of like wondering what the hell it's all about. You know? Well, it's the piggybackers, mate. Take the yeah. piss, drink in, leaving the shit everywhere. Yeah, yeah. The people are there. I understand the reason for Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. I absolutely understand it. I'm on board with climate yeah. climate shit. I am on board with it. But don't be a bad end. If you're going to go down there, support the cause and mm-hmm. don't be a dick about it. Uh, mate, you've got to start wrapping it up. All right, dude. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. We were just jabbing. jabbing. Wait, I apologize. Yeah. Sorry. Well, well, you did ask me want to plug something, right? Yeah, we're doing a new Fun Love and Criminal record. And like right now, I have a studio like this in my house, right? So I'm, yeah, I'm, be, you've only released one track online. Well, the, yeah. Fucking cocktease. Well, that was from, yeah, what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to do it the right way. <laughs> what we're doing is we figure, like I told you, I'm 51. This could be, we're, we're thinking we're, the working title for the record is Our Asia. You know, Steely Dan put that record Asia out, which is arguably one of the best records ever recorded. We're not saying we're like Steely Dan. We're saying in our little fucking world, it would be nice to make our opus like Asia, right? So we're calling it Our Asia, and we're trying really hard to do it. And who knows when it's coming out? But more importantly, we're talking about doing what you love, right? Now, I always thought music was what kind of saved me from a lot of shit, right? And what I did recently is I went down to South America and I shot this documentary. It's in three pieces, and that's probably going to come out before the record. It's probably going to come out, I don't know, maybe right after the new year or into the into the end of the, the winter, right? And it's uh, Huey Morgan's Latin music. I went down to Brazil, broke my foot down there. Ah, uh, you were right, so I was messaging you. you yeah, were, yeah, 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 I had a great yeah, time yeah. down there. I went to Cuba, I went to Puerto Rico, and, you know, I broad brushed a lot of Latin music because that's one of the things I really loved growing up. So hopefully people like music and they like the, the <clears> idea of learning something new. That'll be a kind of a cool thing. Plus, you get to see me walk around with a Guayavera and a white hat like throughout Central America. And it's hilarious. Cool. Looking forward to it. Right, yeah. So how do people keep up, keep up with you? What's yeah, the well, you, can, you, you, can, you can follow me on, on the social networks, but it's not Here like, I, yeah, I'm not really there. But, uh, you know, I guess the best thing to do is just, you know, kind of monitor, you know, what I do uh, professionally. Like I do the Six Music Show and I do my Radio 2 show. So if you listen to that, I'm definitely going to be talking what about it. What time's the Radio 2 show on? Oh, it comes on Saturday mornings from 4 to 6 a.m. What about the uh, other one? The Six Music Show is Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. What are we doing today then? I was re- pre-recording the 4 a.m. show because, you know, I don't yeah, do that shit. Fuck, no, stupid. But I don't think they could get engineers in there to listen to my crazy ass at 4 in the morning. <laughs> Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Dude, Huey, man. My man. Cheers, dude. Thank you, cool. brother.